Good morning once again, everyone. I am very thankful that y'all could join me today. This is one of my favorite Old Testament chapters, I have to say. This and the, this, just the general area that we're in in Genesis is just absolutely amazing. But today we're going to be talking about Joseph again. Uh, we left off with Judah and Tamar having their two sons in the last chapter. Now it's picking right back up from Genesis 37. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. Okay, now just remember real quick, he's just been sold to the Ishmaelites into slavery by his brothers. Okay, so, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You'll often see that whenever the Lord's blessing you, that you'll be exalted in your workplace, around your friends, um, your home. Life will start to get better in just many, many ways, and we'll get into that here in just a second. But this is consistent with Joseph. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Notice Potiphar being a pagan man. He worshipped Osiris, Isis, Horus, and all of these Egyptian gods. He worshipped a lot of these false gods, but he even says... Then the master saw that the Lord was with him. Okay, so even he is giving thanks to the Lord for this new slave that he has. And make no doubt about it, Joseph is a slave. He's a piece of property to these men. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. Now this is... A great bond, a great fr uh, friendship that um, that the Lord blesses with his beloved. He says even he'll even make his enemies to be at peace with you. Even the people that are supposed to hate you by nature, they're supposed to hate you. He'll make you know, he'll bring them into loving you, and not only loving you but trusting you over his whole house, because Potiphar was gone probably quite often, being very exalted with the Pharaoh. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. This is much like, I've seen this in my own life, I've seen this. Um, whenever Christian brethren come in to a place then the place itself becomes blessed. The entire company becomes blessed. The entire business becomes blessed. Everyone associated with the business becomes blessed. And it's because of God. It is not because of, of the Christians. It is because solely of God. God just, he loves them so much that he desires to bless everyone around him, even if they're not worshiping him. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Okay, so Potiphar had so much. He was very, very wealthy, and many, many servants, and Joseph was the top servant, slave among them, and he had so much that he didn't even know what he had. He just left that to Joseph. He didn't fear Joseph stealing anything. That's complete trust. From our um, from the studies that we've gathered, Joseph was ex he was taken into slavery at 17. He spent two years in prison before being exalted at the age of 30. Therefore, you can reckon by math that he spent about 11 years in Potiphar's house. So he was in Potiphar's house for 11 years. That's, that's a long time to grow a friendship with one another. And it also makes mention of this, and Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. So, goodly, if you desire ever to look that up, there's only a few instances where 
a person's appearance is labeled as goodly. That's just handsome. It means handsome. And we see this with Joseph. He was a handsome fellow. He probably in his mid twenties right now. He's one of those young bucks, you know, coming up. And um probably had a lot of energy, very vibrant, good hard worker. And he was also well favored. He was probably well built. He was a probably a built fella. And um we also see this this goodly person stated about King Saul, about King David, about Absalom. And so there's only a few times in the scripture where a man is given this kind of um, compliment. But we see it many, many times with the women. We see it with Sarah, with Rebecca, with Rachel. And these is just this is just the ones right off the top of my head that I can think of. But it's said that they're beautiful throughout the scripture. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. Okay, now I'm going to give a couple of points on this. So Potiphar's wife is watching Joseph for years and years and she just comes out and she says something very blatant. Lie with me. That's that's forceful. This is the most powerful person whenever potiphar is gone she's the most powerful person one can easily read articles like this um, from ancient history encyclopedia and um, it's from ancient eu you can just look this up love sex and marriage in ancient egypt and it goes on to say that women were viewed and this um, just equal to men in egypt and their marriages were a little bit different <clears throat> they um they did love one another and they highly exalted love they would often write poetry to one another these right here were actually much more of what the egyptian women would have looked like they wouldn't have been so white skinned they wouldn't have been necessarily black because even in this very article it says that the more dark skinned that you were the more in the lower class that they placed you maybe not as a slave but you were seen as as a lower class but they didn't really have any very light skinned people at all like myself you wouldn't have seen guys like me walking around there this was middle eastern folk but it's also we're talking about africa egypt so they, these were darker skinned people i mean well uh, whenever we're looking at the rulers over egypt you have to remember they're much darker skinned than they are white many of them probably had very dark skin labs with black many of us would just say uh, so the rulers were darker skinned just a quick side note here's another depiction of what their rulers would have looked like now though they did regard marriage with a certain bit of respect in ancient egypt like we're discussing today they were much more liberal whenever it comes to, um, as the article even states, they did not regard virginity in any special sense. Um, prostitution, they, they, that wasn't a major crime or anything back then. There was no marriage ceremony, uh, ceremony in ancient Egypt. A woman was married to a man as soon as she entered into his house with the goods agreed upon. They would share gifts back and forth, and that was basically it. So marriage was not so big a deal back in ancient Egypt. It was, um, st it was still a big deal, as we'll see later on. Also worthy of note in this article that I found on biblicalcyclopedia.com about Potiphar. Potiphar's name, actually, right down here. Potiphar is described as an officer of Pharaoh, chief of the executioners, an Egyptian. The word we render officer as in the AV is literally eunuch. And the Septuagint Vulgate, so translated here, eunuchus. The, the article also goes on to state that they do not really believe that Potiphar was a eunuch, but it was a possibility being high up in Pharaoh's court. The probability that he was a eunuch, I would give this a 50-50% chance that Potiphar was a eunuch. 
and this may have led to the one of the the, the reasons why Potiphar's wife pursued Joseph so hastily it's, and she probably did this for years we do know that he was probably gone a lot so she wasn't able to be yeah and plus she was sitting around all the time idols hands are the devil's playthings so it's she didn't really have anything else to do all she had to do was sit around and think about her pleasures and her lust what would be fun and she wasn't wanting a relationship with joseph she was just wanting to have a good time with him and she probably lusted after him and as we know day after day but he refused and said unto his master's wife behold my master wotteth not what is with me in the house and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand he says, the master doesn't know what I'm doing at all, ever. That's how much that he trusts me. He says, and he's committed all these things unto my hands. He says, I'm not going to do this great evil to him. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Quite often times we'll cover up words like adultery and it's it gives us a little leeway to commit the sin without feeling so bad about it well it's not it's not fornication it's not adultery it's extramarital affairs or you know uh premarital sex and whatnot it's uh having a good time we're just hey man i'm relieving stress you know and i'm just cutting loose and um I'm just having fun. That's that's it a lot of times. But Joseph doesn't cover this up. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He knows this is a wickedness. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. So this was a persistent problem. This was something which happened to him all the time. He had to deal with this day by day. She just kept and kept on and kept on. You have to remember, they didn't have televisions. They didn't have internet. They had wine, strong drink, and fantasies, royalty, jewelry, and lavishness all around. But they didn't have you know like books like we got today necessarily they didn't have all kinds of other outlets to be entertained by but if you also notice the contrast right here between the chapter that we just read about judah and tamar how judah he goes into a can now this is joseph's brothers and this is the brother in which had the ultimate idea of selling him into slavery so this is the reason why he's here is because of the man we talked about yesterday, which was Judah. Judah goes into a Canaanite land to buy a prostitute after his wife dies, his Canaanite wife dies, and he gets this prostitute and just lays with her like it's nothing. You see, he goes after sin, and it never does say that the Lord was with Judah at that time. It constantly says the Lord is with Joseph. Okay, so... So we see that the brothers are going after the sin. They're going to pay for it. And Joseph, is he's running away from it. And it's being offered to him day by day, just all the time. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. I would guess that Potiphar's wife set this up to trap Joseph because it's kind of abnormal that they weren't in the house because there were some servants, according to my studies, that were just supposed to be in the house, just supposed to work the house, to be servants to her and everybody else. And there was also <clears throat> like bodyguards and stuff supposed to be there. And there was nobody in the house right then. So it seems like she set a trap for Joseph. And she called him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So we can see from this point that it had reached a, a point where she was basically the one trying to rape him. She tore clothes off of him, and she accuses him of trying to rape her, you see. 
So Joseph, he's just having evils done to him without a cause. He doesn't have anything to do with these evils, and they just keep finding him. But one last note on that, on that verse. Um, notice what Paul says to the Corinthians. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Okay, so he's saying flee fornication like Joseph. A lot of times we'll find ourselves lingering around sin. Joseph fled from it. He just got away suddenly. But notice, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Okay, Joseph not only knew that this was a sin against God, but it was also a sin against Potiphar. And he knew the consequences if this woman... Now, we're not told that Joseph ever mingles with another woman during this time either, that he later gets a wife. But it's not like he's fornicating with anyone else, but especially this woman, because there is certain death if it's found out. Now, according to my studies... This would have been, because the servants of the house were not in the vicinity of them, this would have almost appeared to you and me as being a risk-free type of engagement. He maybe could have engaged with Potiphar's wife, and yeah, he would have felt okay for a couple of days, but God would have known. Potiphar may not have found out right away, but the reason why Joseph was being blessed is because of this. Because he walked with the Lord. He he remained faithful in times of trial. God was blessing him because he was doing the Lord's work. He, was a, he went from being exalted to being a slave, and he kept loving God the entire time. We're never told that he says a negative word about his brothers. We're never told that he complains about his situation. We're never told that he argues back with people. He is staying with God. And if he would have done this one act, I believe that that blessing would have temporarily at least been taken from him. And we see that... By our own worldview, it doesn't seem like it prospered him very much at the beginning to have, you know, made her feel so unwanted or whatever to have rejected her advances as he did. But we find out later that it's well, well worth it. And it pretty much shows what the Christian life is all about. Solomon says in Proverbs, So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife wife whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry but if he be found he shall restore sevenfold he shall give all the substance of his house solomon saying if a thief is found stealing bread or something that can be paid back but he says an adulterer if a man takes for one or two nights another man's wife this is the repercussions but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his, repro his reproach shall not be wiped away. He's saying you are in grave danger if you do such a thing. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. He says, no matter what you do to a jealous husband, he says, you're probably still going to die. You could literally give him all the money that you've ever had, and he wouldn't take it as a payment for what you've done to him. So Joseph is well aware of this, and he once again, he flees, and he leaves behind his outer garment. He didn't flee naked. He still had on his undergarments, but he did leave his outer garments. Then she called unto the men of her house, and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. She's claiming they tried to rape her, and she screamed out. Now, this is one of the negatives of the Me Too movement. It's that now any woman that claims anything about any man, for whatsoever reason, the man's almost automatically guilty in the public's eyes. Well, we can see that that's clearly not the case in every uh, circumstance. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. 
and she laid up his garment by her until his lord came home. So she's waiting for Potiphar to get home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, after she got done with telling her side of the story, when Joseph's master heard the words of his wife, when Potiphar heard, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Okay, so Potiphar becomes angry, very, very angry, natural response. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. This shows a little bit about Potiphar's thoughts on the matter. I, this was certain death, a certain death sentence if Potiphar would have believed his wife's report. I believe it was just to kind of appease her and to save face for her. He didn't want to kill Joseph, though. He probably knew that Joseph never would have done this. It's ridiculous. Joseph never exhibited such behavior. And the very fact that she says that he came in mocking her is totally against his character. I mean, the, the rape aside, like, I mean, he comes in and does what? He starts making fun of her or something? <laughs> you know, this, is, this never does fit Joseph at all, even from what we gather from the little bit that we know about him. Potiphar lived with this guy for years there's no way he would fall for this joseph just come in there and just start hey baby how you doing i highly doubt that <laughs> you know but uh i don't know but instead of putting him to death he puts him in the prison but the lord was with joseph once again and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison so the lord is with him again the lord will never leave you nor forsake you he's with you every step of the way and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph, Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. This is incredible. It's like no matter where this guy goes, he is blessed. This shows us a great, great amount if we just dig a little bit in this iceberg, okay? Because Joseph, he was exalted in Jacob's camp. He was exalted in Potiphar's camp. Now he's being exalted in the prison. No matter where he goes, no matter what status he comes in as, he winds up being the ruler of it. And this is all God doing it to him. This shows that it's not. it wasn't Jacob wanting to exalt Joseph. It was God. It wasn't Potiphar wanting to exalt Joseph. It was God. It's not the prison keeper that wanted to exalt Joseph. It was God. God is the one who exalts. Jesus says, humble yourselves before the Lord and in public. He'll, he'll exalt you. He'll exalt you in front of others to show them his power over everyone else. So God is exalting Joseph. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. The keeper of the prison didn't even keep an eye on Joseph totally trusting he wasn't going to try to escape he was just going to do his job now one last note on this very important to keep okay joseph notice how he's being exalted in potiphar's house okay he's being made a supervisor over potiphar's house then he's supervisor over the prison He's got to keep records. He's got to make sure everything's in order. The balance is nothing stolen. He's got to keep an eye on everything, right? He's got to make sure the food supply is good. The water's coming in. Everybody's fed. Everybody's fine. Okay. I totally agree with David Guzik of EnduringWord.com. How Joseph is being prepared He's being taught uh, managerial skills so that whenever, here in just a couple of years, whenever he is set up to look over the food supply, basically manage all of Egypt, he'll have this years of experience built up. You see how God is working, even in the midst of all of this, 
God says, okay. He says, you know, he's putting the pieces here and there, and man don't even catch it, but God's the one doing it. And it's just, it's so incredible. It, it's we, Who can know God? Who can honestly figure out a being like this? But God is obviously doing it. And that is it for Genesis 39. Lord willing, we will get into Genesis 40 tomorrow. I do thank you for being with me. God of peace be with you. Amen.